on. <laughs> I will claim that uh, the contribution that she has made to each one of these two topics would qualify for a PhD thesis. So effectively, in my mind, she has done two PhD theses in one. So fine, so it's probably overqualified. Uh, not surprisingly, she has been very hot in the job market. She will be joining the University of Washington as a, a professor after her PhD, academia for her. But the PhD for her has not been enough in terms of being in academia. She wants to stay maybe quite a bit longer. That's great to hear. But in summary, it's been a privilege to be her PhD advisor. Uh, Karen has been a phenomenal PhD student in all dimensions. A P along all dimensions, a PhD student could be exceptional, both in terms of raw talent, creativity, and also personality. She has really been fostering a very nice positive environment in my lab. So with that, I hope that uh, I set the expectations high enough for her presentation. So now it's the pressure is on you, Karen. Um, thank you um, so much for that kind intro. Um, let me share my screen. Um, oops, sorry. Um, I'll find my Zoom. Mm, sorry. <laughs> I practiced this right beforehand, um, but somehow I'm still messing up. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so thank you, everyone. I, do you see my screen or the wrong screen? We can see the right screen. The right screen. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, not, not, my, not my notes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I know for my friends in Sydney, it's 6 a.m., so I... I really appreciate you waking up early and hopefully you stay awake till the end of it. Um, with that being said, I was told that today was a really special day. Um, it's approximate pi day today. So 22 over seven is a really good approximation for, for pi. So um, if this was an in-person defense, um, I would have tried to make some pies for us all to eat beforehand. And with that, um, let's jump right in. Um, the term robots is no longer synonymous with science fiction, right? In the past, robots have only existed in the confines of the factory floor, right? These were these large automated machines that were designed to perform precise and highly repetitive motions in these highly controlled environments. And so you can see in this picture, there are these cages around the robots um, preventing humans or any foreign objects from getting in their way. Uh, today, uh, robots are becoming more prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, it is possible with just the click of a button to purchase a robot, like a selfie drone or a robotic vacuum cleaner. Although these modern day robots are, um, are physically and functionally different than those robots on the factory floor, they're actually not all that different in that the, both these robots um, can only perform relatively structured tasks. That is tasks that um, have a clearly specified goal and have a, like a strong expectation on what the environment's going to look like. And because of this, the decision-making task uh, for, these, for these robots have been greatly simplified. Um, today, researchers and industry are um, working towards the next wave of robots. Right? These are robots that are, uh, that are required to operate in highly dynamic, uncertain, and unstructured environments. Uh, for, for instance, there has been tremendous progress made in developing self-driving cars. Um, and these cars are required to operate alongside human-driven cars, pedestrians, cyclists. Um, they're expected to operate anywhere, um, different, uh, different places around the world, in different weather conditions and so forth. And so this next generation of robots will be a stark contrast to what we already have. In fact, these robots are expected to, one, um, operate in highly uncertain environments. And this makes it very difficult to make safe and robust decisions. Two, these robots are required to um, interact with human agents and therefore they need to be able to understand human behaviors. And third, these robots are required to perform a variety of tasks and in many different settings, as opposed to just doing one task really well. And, and now we are moving closer to these next generation, these, these next generation robots. 
And this is with the help of advances made in the fields of AI and machine learning. And this visualization here shows the papers that were published in the 2018 International Conference on Robotics and Automation, the, the premier conference for roboticists. And you can see here that deep learning is the number one field with the most papers and authors um, publishing in that topic. In the following year, um, deep learning is still the number one topic and the gap between the second most popular topic has significantly widened. Um, there's, um, I think there's um, almost a 50% increase in the number of papers and authors publishing in, 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 in deep learning in robotics and automation. And this was back in 2019. This trend has just continued to, to um, increase um, over the years. And this really goes to show that deep learning um, has been really pushing the frontier of robotics research. However, as learning enabled methods become um, more pervasive throughout the autonomy stack, it becomes increasingly difficult to ascertain the performance and safety of these robotic systems and explain their behavior. And these are necessary prerequisites for their deployment in safety critical settings, such as where robots are required to interact in close proximity with humans. In fact, um, it has been shown that learning based techniques can perform in unexpected ways. On the left here is a computer vision algorithm predicting that this is an image of a panda with 57% confidence. Now, if we were to add a bit of noise into this image, um, and change the pixel values a little bit um, to the point where it's barely noticeable to the naked eye. This algorithm now thinks that this is a gibbon with with uh, with 99% um, um, oops 99% um, confidence. Um, for reference, this is what a gibbon looks like. Now, if there was a downstream task that depended on the outputs of this algorithm, then we would like to have a mechanism that understands whenever the upstream algorithm is making a mistake and will step in whenever necessary. And for systems operating in safety critical settings, um, especially those involving humans, then it's really important to be able to, it, it's really important to perform this correction in a principled way because any mistakes or errors could result in human injury. And um, further, it's really important to have a notion of accountability in these robots. Because if something were to happen, we need to be able to explain why the robot did what it did. Um, on the right here is a boat racing game where a player's score depends on their position in the race and the amount of points they collect along the way. Now, many AI algorithms such as reinforcement learning um, use demonstrations um, to learn how to perform a task such as playing this game. And despite given many demonstrations, this particular AI algorithm has figured out that rather than make progress in the race, it should just go backwards, spin around in circles and collect these green turbo boosters to get a lot of points that way. And obviously defeating the purpose of being in a race. And so this shows that even with lots of data, it's still really important to be able to specify behaviors we want to see from AI algorithms. Um, otherwise, they will perform in unexpected, undesirable, and potentially dangerous ways. And the takeaway here is that even though learning-based techniques have brought us, uh, brings a lot of promise and can help us tackle very challenging robotics problems, we still need to be fully aware of their shortcomings and understand how to deal with them in a principled way. Um, and to this end, the two research questions that I address in my PhD are, one, how to develop safety assurances for robots interacting with humans? And two, how to provide a degree of transparency and interpretability into learning-based models? In my PhD, I leverage formal methods to provide the rigor and assurances for learning enabled systems. Um, as a quick aside, formal methods are a class of mathematical techniques um, used to specify or verify properties of a system. And they are designed to be rigorous and provide strong performance guarantees. Now, my PhD contributions can be separated into the, these two camps. 
safety and interpretability. And obviously I won't have time to go through all of these topics. And so today I'll just be focusing on these two topics, um, reachability based control and signal temporal logic. And so now let's move on to the first part. I will be discussing my work on reachability based safety assurance for human robot interactions. Before I jump into the details, I want to first introduce the concept of model based planning for human robot interactions and highlight where deep learning can play a significant role. Uh, generally speaking, a robot is given information about the environment and given this information, it needs to make a plan on what the best thing to do is. And this process of figuring out what to do is known as planning or decision making. In model based planning, there is a model that describes what the environment is and how it may change over time. And then the, and then the plans are based on this model and hence the term model based planning. For human robot interactions, um, understanding the environment includes also understanding how the humans in the environment are going to behave. But obviously, writing down a single equation that describes how everyone in the world behaves is extremely challenging. And so a common way to do this is then to use data and learn a neural network to predict how a human may behave, like what, what where, where they could be in the future, essentially. And then using this prediction model, we can then help a robot decide on a plan, such as what trajectory it should take in order to achieve its goal. However, what happens if the predictions are wrong and, um, and lead to the robot making a bad decision, right? For example, what if the robot thought that the humans were gonna go to the right, but then in reality, the humans move to the left. And this may cause the robot to strongly react um, and change its plan in order to stay safe, but to the extent that it can no longer reach its goal. And obviously this is undesirable. Um, instead, we would like to develop in a principled way, robust control techniques that ensure safety for the robot and also the humans around it without unnecessarily sacrificing too much on planning performance. Um, to start off, let's take a look at existing approaches. Um, one way to ensure safety is to do it at the planning level. And a common way is to include a collision avoidance term as part of the planning objective. And this will discourage a robot from getting too close to, um, to the human agents. But unfortunately, this means that safety is now competing with other planning objectives like minimize time or maintain a high speed. And so strict uh, safety isn't treated in a strict way. Now, a more conservative approach could, is one where you could propagate forward the states of um, the human agents and see where they could possibly be in the future. And you tell the robot to keep out of those regions. However, this can lead to overly conservative behaviors and prevent freedom of motion for the robot, which is necessary to convey intent, especially in human robot interactions. Uh, furthermore, planners typically don't replan fast enough to react to split second threats, and they also often use a simplified dynamics model. Alternatively, we can look further down the autonomy stack um, and ensure safety at the control level. Um, and a common approach is to use reactive controllers where um, where when where when the system is in an unsafe situation, it will switch to a backup or emergency controller. And, and however, um, this can be too invasive, right? And lead to another dangerous situation, right? Imagine you have an autonomous car that suddenly slams on its brake in the middle of the highway, right? This can maybe avoid hitting the car in front, but this could cause a rear end collision. Another approach um, is to restrict the set of controls that an, a robot can take. Um, and this line of work has shown to be quite effective. However, there is the question of how to perform this restriction in a principled way so it can still capture the interactions between the human and the robot. Um, kind of given all that, the main idea in my work is to complement the planner and controller 
with a safety monitor that constantly checks how safe the system is, and then will intervene with safe controls whenever necessary. Okay, well, I mean, that's a pretty simple idea. Um, but the challenge here is figuring out when the safety controller should step in and with what, right? What, what is considered a safe control? Uh, furthermore, we want to be respectful to the planner because at the end of the day, we put a lot of work into the planner and it's designed to make intelligent decisions for the robot to accomplish its goal. And so while we want to be safe, we also don't want to be throwing away the plan. We don't want to be throwing the planner out the window. Um, and in my work, I propose leveraging Hamilton Jacoby reachability theory. And this is a type of formal method used to verify the performance and safety properties of dynamical systems. And now I'll give a brief overview on Hamilton Jacoby reachability. To start off, um, we first need to understand what backward reachability is. And so here we have a human and a robot. Uh, we want to ask the question which states may lead to collision in the future? Okay. And one way to um, approach this question is to first write down what are the collision states that we want to avoid in the future, right? So, um, so basically we wanna never be inside this, this um, orange circle because it means that we are in collision. And then we can, loosely speaking, work backward in time to the present time um, and figure out what are the set of states that we want to avoid now so that we would never end up in that collision set in the future, right? And computing th this set that we want to avoid now is no, um, I will refer to this set as the unsafe set. Um, and so HJ reachability allows us to do this backward propagation in a principled way. Um, but in order to do this propagation, we first need to make some assumptions about how the agents are behaving. Um, so first, we assume that each agent acts optimally. Um, specifically, to be extra cautious, we assume that at any point in time, the human is doing the worst thing possible to cause a collision. Um, while the robot, who wants to stay safe, is doing the best thing it can to avoid a collision. Um, Another assumption we make is that we both know the dynamics, or we know the dynamics and controls of both agents. Um, and then we also assume that this propagation backwards in time is done over a finite time horizon. And given these assumptions, solving this backward reachability problem boils down to solving the Hamilton Jacobi Isaacs partial differential equation, as you can see on the top right. And the solution to this equation is V, um, and that is what I will call the HJ, or Hamilton Jacobi, value function. And all this computation is done offline. Um, as a quick aside, if you're familiar with optimal control theory or have taken Marco's 203 class, um, this equation is just the zero sum differential gain version of the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So now going back to the HJ value function, this is a scalar valued function that depends on state and time. And so if we plot the, uh, the function out in the joint state, it might look like this contour map. And then we can recover the unsafe set um, by looking at all the states where the value is negative. And this value function that we have computed is very informative. Um, in fact, it measures exactly how close the system is to collision assuming the human is doing the worst thing possible to cause a collision, while the robot is doing the best thing possible to avoid a collision. Um, and so the takeaway here is that we can compute this value function and negative values are bad and positive values are good. And larger the positive value, the better. Um, so here is just a more concrete definition of this unsafe set. And it's like just summarizing what I've just said. The, set, the unsafe set is a set of states that result in inevitable collision under worst case controls by the human. And it's whenever the value is negative. Now, another useful property of the value function is that it informs us what are appropriate things the robot should do in order to avoid capture. So 
whenever the value or whenever the system is in a state where the value is close to zero, so this means that it is close to being in the unsafe set, ideally we want the robot to move in a direction that increases the value function as fast as possible. So it should move in this uh, direction of the red arrow because that's the gradient. However, the dynamics of the robot restricts the direction it can move in. Um, so instead, it should be choosing controls that prevent the value from decreasing. So it should only choose controls that will increase the value um, and not decrease it. And so it should move in that darker green region. And essentially, we can now define the safety preserving control set as the set of controls that prevent the value function from decreasing over time, assuming that the human agent or the other agent is doing the worst thing possible. So given these two definitions, we can start to answer the original question we had. You know, when should the safety controller step in and with what? Well, it should step in whenever the value is close to zero, because remember, negative values are bad, positive values are good. And it should step in using the safety control, preserving control set. So now we'll talk about how we can design a minimally interventional safety controller so it doesn't um, significantly compromise on planning performance. Um, so first let's take a closer look at the controller. Um, the controller is a module in the autonomy stack that computes the actuation commands that tells the robot exactly how to move in order to execute what the planner wants to do. Um, and a typical controller is one that strives to minimize the error between what the planner wants to do and what is dynamically feasible by the system. And this can be viewed as an optimization problem where, where the, we want to minimize tracking error subject to control dynamics and state constraints. And this optimization problem is executed in a model predictive control fashion, meaning as the system moves, the optimization problem is constantly updated and solved at each time step. Um, and so in the nominal case where there is no safety mechanism at play here, the controller will just try and do whatever the planner wants to do, even if the planner is spitting out something that could be potentially dangerous. Um, the traditional HJ reachability controller, on the other hand, um, whenever the system is in an unsafe situation, it will switch. So it will kind of throw that nominal controller away or it uh, will not use it for the moment and will switch to this optimal HJ controller, which is the control that increases the value function as much as possible. Um, however, by switching, the controller is now essentially ignoring what the planner wants to do in order to stay safe. And while in some cases this may be necessary and even desirable, but in general, this will prevent the robot from accomplishing its goals. Now, what I propose in my work is a minimally interventional HJ safety controller. Um, in this setting, the, tracking, the controller is still trying to track whatever the planner wants to do. But whenever the system is in a situation where the value function, the HJ value function is close to zero, a control constraint will be activated. And this is shown in the red box. And this control constraint will restrict the controller to only choose controls from the safety preserving control set. And what this means is, the controller is still trying to minimize for tracking error, right? So it's still trying to do whatever the planner wants to do. But now it will minimally deviate from the desired trajectory to the extent necessary to stay safe. Okay, so given this proposed controller, I tested it in a, in a traffic weaving scenario where we have two cars initially side by side and they must swap lanes in a short amount of time and distance. So I'm sure many of you have experienced this traffic weaving scenario. You might be trying to get onto the highway and then there's another car that's trying to get off the highway at the same time. And there's this really um, kind of awkward or challenging negotiation that needs to occur. Um, and so in this experimental setup, an autonomous car shown in red here 
um, is using a neural network to predict how the other car is going to behave and uses this prediction to inform its planner. And so it's using a model-based planner, essentially. And then there's a low-level tracking controller, and this is based on the work of Matt Brown from the Stanford Dynamic Design Lab. So thanks, Matt. Um, and this controller, as I mentioned before, is just going to track whatever the planner wants to do. Now, um, and then there's a safety monitor that is using the reachability theory that I just described. And um, it will step in whenever necessary and will take minimally interventional safe controls. Cool. Um, and so here I did some experiments and simulation, and this is to demonstrate the kind of behaviors we see using the three different control strategies I just described. And so in this setup, um, uh, we have the, re the red car is the human and the green car is the human driven car. And that's actually me on an Xbox controller. And I'm going to just suddenly and carelessly swerve into the red car. And we want to see how the red car responds. Um, and you can see the unsafe set shown in the white contour. And the, the system is considered unsafe whenever the green car gets too close to the white line. Um, as I play this video, there's going to be a bunch of lines coming out from the green car. And this is representing the robot's prediction of what the human might do in the future. And then there's going to be a line coming out of the red car representing what the robot wants to do. Okay, so in this first video, this is the tracking only case. So there is no safety mechanism at play and the controller is just doing whatever the planner wants to do. You can see as the green car swerves, um, the red car actually tries to slow down a little bit, but it just wasn't able to slow down fast enough and urgent enough, and obviously a collision occurred. So let me play this video again. Cool. So yeah, very clearly a, a collision has occurred, as you can see here. In this next video, um, this is the switching case. So this is the case where the controller will switch to the optimal HJ controller. Um, so playing this, and you can see it's a green car swerves and gets close to the white line. The red car swerves and does a pretty hard break and essentially just not fly, but like goes off the road um, quite by qu quite an amount. So let me play this again. Um, and so obviously the red car is safe, no collision has occurred, but this might be actually dangerous, especially if there's a road boundary um, along this, uh, on the side of this road. And now in this final video, video, this is what I'm proposing in my work, which is a minimally interventional safety controller. And you can see as the green car swerves, the red car swerves as well, but only to the extent necessary to stay safe. And it very quickly gets back onto the road to finish the traffic weaving maneuver. And I'm just gonna just pause on this, this snapshot here and just to show you the difference in how much the red car has left the road. Um, cool. So now let's take a, um, so the next thing I did was to test these, this algorithm on a full scale vehicle. And thanks to, uh, and this was done in collaboration with the Stanford Dynamic Design Lab. And so here we have X1, which is a steer by wire vehicle. And X1 played the role of an autonomous car. Um, for obvious safety reasons, um, the human, we couldn't get a, another full scale car for the human driven car. And instead, it will be a virtual car that is joystick controlled. And you can see Ed in the lab holding an Xbox controller in his hand while sitting inside X1. Uh, so that was a bit of an experience there. Um, and so I did a bunch of experiments um, using the three different control strategies and plotted the different trials on the safety versus efficiency plot. Um, safety here is measured in terms of the integral of the value function and whenever the value drops below zero. I guess a quick note here is that even though reachability theory tells us that the value should never go below zero, there's actually model mismatch between the math that we use to compute the reachability computation and what is actually happening on the real system. And that's why 
there will be times where the value dips below zero. Um, I touched on this in a few slides, but um, I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A and also in the closed session. Um, but in terms of the safety metric, higher values indicate safer, safer interactions. In terms of efficiency, it is measured in terms of one minus the g-force experienced on the car. So higher values indicate a smoother ride. And obviously the top right-hand corner is where we wanna be, where we're both safe and very efficient. And you can see that in the case where it's just tracking only, um, it is very efficient, um, but not very safe. Um, that's because the planner is trying to optimize for efficiency or performance. Um, and sometimes it's not able to react fast enough to, to unsafe situations. And then in the yellow, this is a switching controller. And you can see that it's very safe, um, but not very efficient. And because it's the controller switches to the optimal collision avoidance control, um, this resulted in a lot of hard braking and lots of swerving. And sitting in the car, that was not very comfortable. And now in the green is what um, I'm proposing in my work, which is the minimally interventional safe control strategy. And you can see that it sits right in the middle between the other two strategies. Um, it's almost as safe as a switching controller and almost as efficient as the just tracking only controller. And this just shows that um, our method um, achieves a good balance between safety and efficiency. Uh, finally, um, uh, I did an experiment with a second physical car, um, but this was just the one temp scale RC car. Um, and had a LiDAR visible mast as it, um, so that the LiDARs on board X1 could detect it. Um, and this, and so I'm going to play this video. It's a little hard to see the little RC car, but maybe you can see it over Zoom. Um, there's an overlay on the bottom left to show you where the cars are. And you can see that X1 could, swear, could speed up, swerve a little bit and pass in front of that RC car. And this experiment just showed that uh, the algorithm still worked, even with a, a bit of perception uncertainty in the loop. And so summarizing the first part of my talk, I have developed a minimally interventional safety controller rooted in HJ reachability for safe human robot interactions. In terms of future work, um, as I mentioned before, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to uh, there needs to be work done to address the model mismatch between what reachability, between the math used for reachability computations and what is actually implemented, uh, what, 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 the, what the dynamics are of the real car. Um, unfortunately, the reachability computation suffers from the curse of dimensionality. So we can't just naively increase the model fidelity of, of the equations. Um, and so I think looking into data-driven methods could be a scalable way to fill in this gap. Um, uh, a second branch of direction for future work is to revisit the assumptions that are inherent to the reachability computation. So um, as I mentioned before, reachability is assuming that the human-driven car or the human agent is doing the worst thing possible to cause a collision. And obviously this isn't, true in real life, not everyone on the street is out to get you. And so we need to revisit this assumption and see how we can relax it and making it more reflective of actually how humans behave in the real world. Okay, cool. So now moving on to the second part of my talk, um, logical reasoning and robot learning. Um, so there are rules that govern how a system should operate. Um, depending on the application, a system could refer to you know, the robot itself, like an autonomous car, um, or the components within the autonomy stack, such as the controller, the planner, or, or, some, or something else. And these rules and constraints um, can be explicitly known ahead of time based on the problem definition, or they could also stem from designers, the designer's domain expertise. For instance, there are rules of the road that dictate how drivers on the road should behave. And these rules could come from say the DMV handbook, but it also can come from just kind of unspoken rules and, um, and that, that we have developed 
just based on experience. And knowledge of these rules are not only critical for successful deployment, but it's also a useful form of inductive bias when designing such a system and the components within. And so the goal of this second half of my work um, is to develop techniques that enable us to specify and encode rules into robot decision making and control. Um, in other words, you know, how can we translate some of the domain expertise into math that is machine compatible so that it can be used to provide structure and interpretability into the components that make up the autonomy stack? Um, and a standard approach is to use for a formal language, which is a math mathematical language that is designed to describe rules and specifications that we would like to see from a system. And a popular language used in robotics is linear temporal logic. So roughly speaking, this LTL language or linear temporal logic language is defined over atomic propositions. Um, you can think of them as like discrete states. And these and LTL has been used in many high level planning tasks um, because it can encode uh, specifications like we want to keep the robot outside of this region at all times, or it could also encode things like, um, I want to make sure that I can always go back to the charge point to recharge the robot. And there's actually a lot of rich theory behind LTL. Um, and there are ways to synthesize a planner that will satisfy the LTL specification. However, these algorithms can become intractable very quickly as we transition to continuous states and start to think more about controls and dynamics. Um, and also, um, LTL can only tell us whether or not something is true or false um, and nothing in between. And so given these considerations, um, while LTL has been used in many planning problems, we do want a more expressive language and one that can be more flexible and scalable when it comes to synthesizing robot algorithms. Um, and so I looked into a different language, in particular, signal temporal logic, um, which is a relatively new language, and it describes the spatial temporal properties of signals. Um, and so this STL language is made up of these logic operations or logical operators, and you can think of them as building blocks. And there is an associated grammar, um, like with the English language, there's a grammar that describes how you can compose these operators one after the other to create a more complicated formula. And so here the operators are things like and, or, or not. Um, the temporal part of signal temporal logic means that we can reason about these logical operators over time intervals. So we can start to think about things like, we always want A and B to be true. Or we can also say things like, between times 10 to 20, we eventually want B to be true. And then finally, the signal part means that we are evaluating these logical operations over signals, which are continuous real value time series. Um, and this could be the trajectory as, of your robot as it moves through space and time. Um, an example of an STL formula we could construct using this STL language could be, uh, if the car is in the left lane, then it should accelerate until it passes the adjacent right car. Um, now, a really special property of STL is that it is equipped with a notion of robustness, um, which is a measure of how much a signal satisfies or violates an STL formula. So not only can it tell you whether or not a formula is true or false, but it can tell you how true or how false it is. So let's consider a very simple example. Suppose we have an STL formula that is describing that an autonomous car should always stay below the speed limit. So this is a very simple formula. For this particular speed profile, the speed limit is, is never exceeded. And so the robustness value here will be positive. And the magnitude of the robustness value will correspond to like the, the, the height of that little arrow there. For this second speed profile, 
the speed limit is violated, and this will result in a negative robustness value. And again, the magnitude will correspond to the height of that arrow. And then for this speed profile, the um, speed limit is violated even more, and this will correspond to an even more negative robustness value. And so with this notion of robustness, we can start to think about how changes in the input signal will affect the robustness value. In other words, we can start to think about gradients. And that's really exciting because a lot of robot algorithms depend on gradients. Um, for example, you know, neural networks are trained using gradient descent. And so the challenge now is to find an efficient way to compute these robustness values and also their gradients. Um, fortunately, when it comes to computing these robustness values, there's actually a systematic way to do it. So here are the formulas or the robustness formulas corresponding to each STL operator. Now, don't worry too much about the notation, it can be a little scary, um, but just note that these are made up of like uh, sub subtraction, multiplying it by minus one, a lot of max and mins. Um, for the temporal operators, you're taking a max and min over the time dimension. Um, and so in my work, I cast each of these formulas into a computation graph. Um, now, most of them are pretty straightforward, except for the temporal operators. I, I won't go into too much details, but this involves designing a recurrent computation graph and performing dynamic programming in order to compute the robustness value. Um, and so the takeaway here is that for each STL operator, there's a corresponding robustness formula, and then there's a corresponding computation graph for it. And so given any STL formula, we can look at the operators that were used to construct that formula and then back out the syntactical structure. And then given this structure, we can just replace each operation with the corresponding computation graph. Um, and, then, and then by combining that all together, we can pass in signals and spit out the robustness value. And this technique of translating STL robustness formulas into computation graphs is what I have named STLCG. But why go through all this trouble? Like what is the benefit of expressing these formulas as computation graphs? Um, well, it is because we can then use modern deep learning packages to implement STLCG because they too use um, computation graphs under the hood. Um, computation graphs are what allows us to perform automatic differentiation to obtain gradients. And so I have implemented STLCG using PyTorch, a very popular deep learning library in the Python programming language. And I also have a version in Julia that's in the process of being released. And what this essentially means now is that STLCG shares the same computational backbone as deep learning making it possible and straightforward to incorporate logic when developing neural network models. And so for the last part of my talk, I'm going to go through three examples demonstrating how we can use STLCG to infuse domain expertise into the construction of neural network models. Uh, a simple way is to leverage a simple way to leverage STLCG is to include an STL robustness term in the loss function so that um, when we are training, we can just backpropagate through it. So in this first example, we have a simple supervised learning problem where we want to learn a neural network that can fit this noisy data. And so we just train a two layer neural network. So something that's pretty simple. It does a reasonably good job. However, suppose that based on domain expertise, we know that between one to three seconds, the signal needs to be very close to 0.5. Um, and we can construct an STL formula that describes this behavior. But if that's the case, then the model that we learned on the top right isn't really doing a good job. And instead, we can just simply augment the training loss with an STL term that penalizes the output for violating the STL formula. And simply by doing this with all things equal, um, we're able to learn a model that produces a more desirable output. 
Um, in this second example, we're looking at a sequence to sequence prediction task. Um, given some trajectory um, shown in green, we want to predict what the future trajectory looks like shown in blue. Um, and this is a pretty common setup in human behavior prediction problems. Now, if we just trained a neural network, in particular, a recurrent neural network, um, it, we can very easily perform this prediction task. However, there's no way of knowing how this model is going to perform past the two second mark. Um, now, suppose that based on domain knowledge that we know that the sequence will eventually converge to 0.5. Right, this is um, you know, maybe reminiscent of a car changing lanes. Um, we know that, th that this car will eventually be in the next lane, but it's not gonna end up halfway in between. And so similar to the previous example, we can add an STL term to the loss function and penalize the model for violating the STL formula. And as you can see, again, with all things equal, where the only difference is now in the loss function, um, we're able to now learn a model that is able to do the prediction and achieve the desired long-term behavior. In this last example, we examine how we can use STLCG to provide interpretable structure into latent space models. So um, a latent space model has a bottleneck in its architecture, as you can see here. And the goal of this bottleneck is to force the model to extract salient features that are the most relevant for the task. And the hope is that this, um, this latent representation um, will be something that's meaningful and ideally interpretable. Unfortunately, this is done in, often done in an unsupervised manner. And so there really isn't guarantee that this latent representation will be interpretable. And so our goal here then is to approach this in a more structured way um, using STLCG to provide a bit of supervision into how this latent space is constructed. Um, and so in this example, we have a data set of trajectories, and you can see that this is a multimodal data set because there are three different types of trajectories that characterize it. Um, and our goal here is to learn a latent space model, namely a variational autoencoder for those who are familiar. Um, and we want to reproduce trajectories that look similar to this training data. And if we just learn a vanilla VAE model, we are not able to reproduce tra trajectories that look similar to the training data. In particular, we are unable to capture the three different types of trajectories that we see in the blue, green, and orange. Now, Given our domain knowledge about the data set, we see that these trajectories all converge to different values. And so we can construct a template STL formula that describes the behavior, but we leave some of the parameters unknown. And you can see here, um, that's the parameter C. Um, and what we can do is by construction, we can make it that for every input, the corresponding latent vector will select parameters for this STL formula. And then that STL formula is then used in the loss function. And again, just by doing this and having all things equal, we're able to then produce a model that, is, um, that can produce the trajectories that we want, um, as you can see on the bottom left. And so not only have we produced a model that is performing better, um, but the latent variables now have an interpretation. Um, they correspond to parameters of this STL template formula. Okay, so summarizing the second part of my talk, um, I have introduced STLCG as a technique for expressing STL robustness formulas as computation graphs. Um, and as a result, it can now be cast in the same computational language as neural networks. And with this connection, we can start to look into developing novel neural network architectures that are embedded with temporal logics. Um, this means we can leverage STLCG to encode domain expertise into the model, such as driving rules for autonomous cars. Um, and, and as I showed through some examples today, um, it could be used to improve long-term prediction performance. It could be used to create maybe rule abiding agents. Um, and that is something that could be very useful 
in developing smarter AI agents in driving simulators. We also hope that by incorporating logic in the, into the model, it can aid in performing complex decision-making tasks. Um, and additionally, um, STLCG could potentially be used to create more interpretable structure and transparency into neural networks through the lens of temporal logic. Um, and with that, um, in conclusion, um, today we discussed two main threads. First, we looked at how we can use Hamilton Jacobi reachability to construct a safety controller that steps in whenever um, a learning based planner kind of gets it wrong. And then, secondly, we developed STLCG as a paradigm to infuse logical structure into deep learning models. Um, in terms of kind of open research questions and kind of uh, future work, one thing I want to continue looking at is in the topic of synergistic safe robot autonomy. And so in the first part of my talk, I looked at how a controller can be used to complement a planner, but can we do a similar thing throughout the autonomy stack? Could a planner be used to complement a perception algorithm and could a perception algorithm be used to complement a controller? Um, and, and so traditionally, the components of the autonomy stack are, des are often designed in isolation, but there's actually a lot of interactions that occur once you put them together. And so taking a deeper look into these interactions and optimizing it, I think is a really interesting research direction. Um, secondly, um, in my work, I've brought up the term interactions and safety critical settings. And I think it's worth um, taking a deeper look into understanding exactly what those terms mean mathematically. And if we can come up with a metric that can measure interactivity or safety criticality, then this would be very useful for validating robot algorithms or even generating interesting data sets. And then finally, in order to develop safe and trustworthy robot autonomy, we need to start looking beyond safety and investigate other things like fairness, trust, and ethics. Um, however, coming up with a good mathematical model for this is challenging, and this will require discussions with um, other stakeholders and performing some sort of value-sensitive design. Um, and with that, um, before I go into q and I want to acknowledge some really important people um, who made this all possible. Um, so first, people who funded my research. Um, either through research assistantships, internships, and fellowships during my time at Stanford. Um, next to my committee, um, thank you so much for making the time today. I know today was a very long day for many of you. Um, oops. Um, so Marco, thank you for seeing the potential in me when I stumbled into your lab. I am so grateful for all the opportunities you have provided and I'm very appreciative of all the hard work you have put into your lab and students um, so that we can be our best selves and do our best work. Um, and I really couldn't ask for a better advisor. Um, so here I have a picture, um, picture um, of you at the Aero Astro Multicultural Food Fair that I helped organize a couple years back. Um, I was trying really hard to get faculty to show up to more department events. And so I was um, bugging you for a whole week about it. And, and you said you would be there and, and you did, um, but you were 45 minutes late. <laughs> By then everyone had, had left, but I was really glad you showed up um, and you kept your word. And it really goes to show that you really do care about your students and that you value being part of the community. Um, next, Mac. Uh, I feel so lucky to have been able to interact with you over the years. Uh, you started at Stanford at the same year I arrived. Um, I remember you being at our orientation, actually. Um, and so, through, you know, we got to know each other through our monthly TRI meetings. And I, I think you ask really good questions during the student presentations. And you really show a lot of interest in everyone's work, even though the student might not necessarily be your own. And I can also see how much you care about students in the way you teach. Um, your state estimation class was one of my favorite classes at Stanford. Um, you taught the core concepts so well that 
I didn't really have to memorize anything because I could just derive it if I needed to. Um, but with that being said, um, I hope you don't ask me any questions about that course. Uh, my brain's kind of at full capacity right now. Um, so here I do have a picture of you. Um, sorry, I, I messed up my animation. So these the bottom two faces shouldn't show up yet, but um, here, th this is a picture of you, Mac. Um, this was a Friday morning. Um, and this is when we are the women in Aero Astro group was having morning tea. And you walked by looking a little lost and you asked us if you knew where your lab meeting was. Um, we didn't, but we offered you a donut instead. Um, and we were just really happy that a faculty finally showed up to one of our events. Um, uh, whoops. Uh, Chris, I admire so much your passion and dedication to cars, to research, and most importantly, um, to your teaching. Um, your vehicle dynamics class was uh, by far one of the most enjoyable classes I've ever taken. And much of it was because of the amount of time and energy that you spend into the class. Um, in fact, during the class, there were group meeting projects that we had to attend. And you had been at Vail the whole day talking to all the student groups. And I showed up for my meeting. I think it was around lunchtime and I had a banana with me hoping to snack on it after the meeting. But I guess you had been working the, the, you know, the whole morning, you probably didn't even have lunch. And halfway through our meeting, you um, took my banana and started eating it. Um, and the funny thing was, I, the next time I was at Vail, it was also around lunchtime and I saw you and you were also eating a, a banana then, but you probably needed that banana more than me that day. Um, anyways, um, here's a photo that um, we took at Thunder Hill, April 10th, 2019. I'm sorry, I, I screwed up my animation there, but um, this was at my dad's birthday that day. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't spend it with him because we were at Thunder Hill. But it was tradition for us to go to KFC every year um, on his birthday. And so after dinner, I asked if we could cross the road to take a photo in front of the KFC. And you instantly ushered everyone across the road just to help me take this photo. So I really appreciate that. Um, Michael, even though I'm not in your lab, I could always feel your enthusiasm and dedication all the way from the Duran basement or what you call the dungeon. Your work ethic and time management skills are, are truly aspirational and you make me want to work harder every day. And despite the sizzle and a ASL rivalry, um, you have always made me feel welcome. Um, you always remind me that I belong at Stanford and you've always advocated for me. And for that, I'm truly, truly grateful for. And so this is a photo that we took um, at Paris um, where you welcomed me into your sizzle photo shoot that evening. And that was one of the fanciest engineering events that I've ever attended. Um, Dorsa, uh, thank you so much for chairing my defense. Um, you don't know how relieved I was when you said you were free during this time slot. Um, honestly, um, finding a time with my other committee members was like herding cats. Um, and so Dorsa, you're the second female engineering professor I've ever taken a class from. And you're the first female professor I've ever met. And although we don't interact that regularly, I look up to you and I think you're an amazing role model for me and for everyone else here. I'd also want to mention that um, it was your RSS paper that inspired my first paper at Stanford. So thanks for um, kickstarting my PhD research. Um, so I don't actually have a photo of you, but what I do have is a screenshot of one of your presentations. Um, I was at your job talk a few years back and your presentation was literally one of the best presentations I've ever had, uh, I've ever seen in my life. Um, and this, I think it was like one of your last slides that you had this beautiful Venn diagram and that somehow really stuck in my mind. And whenever I make a presentation, I always think about your slides. Um, other professors I'd like to quickly thank, uh, Abbas and Stephen, who, who gave me the opportunity to TA for their course. Um, not only did that provide me the much needed financial support during my time, during my masters, um, but I got to see firsthand your passion your, and your excitement for teaching. And that makes me really excited to teach as well. 
And I think it's really important to have really passionate and dedicated educators um, to inspire the next generation of engineers. Um, so thank you to my committee. Um, and next, I wanted to thank the Stanford community. I am so, so, so grateful to have been able to work with such amazing and smart and hardworking people um, that who I constantly learn so much from. So I also want to have a shout out to my co-authors, Ed, um, Nikos, Boris, John Talbot, Mo, Simon, Jinri, Wolf, and Michelle. Um, and also want to shout out, give a shout out to Benoit, Amin, Robin, and Ming Yu for making my time, for making the time to be my sounding board and providing a safe space when there's no such thing as a silly question. Um, to Ben, Federico and Nicoletta, thank you for making my early years in the ASL welcoming and warm and enjoyable. Um, I stumbled into the lab feeling like an imposter, but you've always reminded that I belong there. Um, now, half of my PhD wouldn't have been possible without the X1 team. Um, it has been a huge honor and privilege to work with you. Um, and learn not just about cars, but you know, what it means to work together as a team. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude to the rest of the DDL and cars who have definitely added more color and glitter to my time at Stanford. Um, and to my other friends, I'm Tess, Jesse, Anthony, Hannah, Kyle, the rest of my master's cohort, um, we are um, the AA staff. So thank you for all the good times, the laughter, the sad times as well at times. Um, um, helping with homework and quals. Um, I'm so grateful to have people like you to keep me sane and remind me that there is a world outside the walls of the Duran basement. Um, friends outside of Stanford. Uh, first, Jared and Allison. Living away from family is really difficult, but living with you, um, living with you for the past few years has made it so much easier. And I'm so, so, so blessed to have found such generous, caring, and warm people to live with. And it was a relief to know that I'd be coming home to a stress-free place with delicious baked goods um, after a long day in the lab. Uh, Michael, Nathan, Rachel, Hayong, thank you for providing uh, many excuses to eat an insane amount of food in one sitting and not making me feel bad about it. It provided me with a much needed energy to do work. Uh, Sylvia, uh, thank you so much for the support, advice, and encouragement that you have given me over the past year. And I can't wait to kind of hang out again at some fancy conference. Um, Andrea, I can't begin to explain how much I enjoyed working with you, um, especially uh, during our internship. And I really can't believe that we only got to know each other and work together in the final stretches of our PhD. I'm so excited for our first in-person date um, next week to Horn Barbecue. Uh, friends from San Diego, uh, Alexi, Wei, Jesse, and Meng, um, you, you made my first trip to the US so enjoyable that I couldn't wait to come back for more. Um, to my UCID friends and friends from Sydney, um, I, you know, without you, I would not have had the motivation to show up to class or even consider the thought of doing research or a PhD. I didn't even know what PhD stood for back then. Um, and a lot of who I am today has been shaped by you all. Um, Leticia, um, you know, we have been friends since we were six and thank you so much for having your wedding in Bali. Um, 2019 was the year I got silver status with United. And so thank you for helping me get some uh, economy plus seats. And I'm so glad I also got to see you in Paris and Stockholm that year. Mel, uh, we have been friends since we were 13 and you're one of my trendiest friends and um, you remind me that there is a world outside math and science and I'm really grateful for that. Now, a huge, huge, huge mention goes out to the furry friends. Um, they have kept me company over the years, um, especially during the pandemic. Boson, Leo, Riley, Cheerio, um, your endless supplies of cuddles and photos have kept me um, happy and filled with joy every day. Uh, without them, um, I would be a very depressed and a grumpy old lady. Um, special mention goes to Leo, who has 
been constantly keeping me honest while working from home the past year. Um, he comes into my room every other hour, making sure that I am still focused on doing what I was supposed to do yesterday. Um, and so Marco, I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Um, I seriously think that you should consider getting a lab pet because it will definitely um, improve your students' productivity. And finally, um, to my family, especially my parents, mom and dad, none of this would have been possible without your love and support. Um, it's been really difficult living so far away from home, but I can always feel your love and support more than you know, 7,000 miles away. Um, and of course, to Boson, um, you constantly bring joy to my world. And every day I'm not at home, the more spoiled you get. So have fun. <laughs> and with that, um, I, I'm sorry I'm over time, but I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Right. Let's thank Karen and let's take a couple of questions. Um, you can either raise your hand and I can call on you or just ask your questions or put it in chat. And as a reminder, the committee questions will be in the closed session. Uh, I've got a question. Hi, this is, uh, I'm Felix. Uh, hey, Felix. From Sydney. Thank, hey, Karen. Thank you for uh, staying for awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, it was engaging, so it wasn't too hard. Um, I've got a question about your reachability uh, backward reachability analysis uh, mm -hmm. based MPC, uh, maybe based isn't quite the right word, um, but uh, you touched on this a little bit on your future work. You talked about how the human agent would be doing the worst thing possible to cause entry to the unsafe set, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even though you're only applying this at certain times, uh, yeah. you're only applying this constraint to MPC at certain times, do you find in practice a lot of quite conservative behavior like are there times where you can get really uh kind of yeah uh, conservative behavior as opposed to realizing the performance of your, of your um yeah definitely this uh affects the shape of the unsafe set so obviously if you loosen that assumption that yeah the agent's doing the worst thing possible the, sh the unsafe set would shrink a little bit um and so actually a problem um, that we saw during um, the experiments was that the unsafe set was like pear shaped and it actually was kind of um, a little bit too fat so, and it protruded into the other lane. And so if the other car was actually too close to the middle of the lane, it would uh, initiate that, that switch to execute that safe controller. Um, so in that case, yeah, it was a little bit too conservative. So that's why future work is to kind of relax that assumption. Um, but in the, I didn't really go into the details today, but um, we, we as, in, in the setup, we assumed that the human was like more agile than it really was in real life. Um, and so that we could also lose it, like change how we model the other agents uh, through the dynamics. Yeah, okay, cool. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Cool. So if there are no other questions, since you're over time, maybe we should go to the closed session. Let's let's thank Karen again. And let's meet at the closed session at 2.15. Great. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing. <laughs> See ya. Okay.